Hello, my name's Andrew Hunt, and I am the writer and director of Level. You know, this idea, this script actually is about 15 years old. The idea, actually, the, the genesis of the idea started with me playing a video game. I was playing Silent Hill 2. And if anyone's ever played this game, the first 10 to 15 minutes of the game, nothing happens. You're just this guy wandering through the woods with a flashlight. And again, nothing's, nothing's happening. But you know from the back of the, the case of the game, from some of the other images that you've seen, like on, uh, like, uh, you know, on the disc, that you're going to be dealing with some pretty terrifying creatures on this adventure. And so it makes the first you know, 15 minutes of the gameplay, like there's an extreme anxiety that's kind of kicking in you because you know it's coming. You just don't know when. And the longer that they draw it out, the more anxious, uh, the more terrified you become because you know it's coming. And as I was playing, I just kept thinking about like, man, I wonder what this guy is going through. I mean, what if this guy, this character that I'm manipulating through this dark, crazy world has no idea why he's even there? Like he just woke up one day and he's wandering through the woods and he has no clue as to what's happening. Now, granted, I have a little bit more information than he does because I'm the one playing the game, so I kind of have an idea where the story might take me. I do know that I'm going to be dealing with these terrifying monsters, but he doesn't. For him, he's just walking through the woods with a flashlight. And that's kind of where the idea started, is what would happen if a video game character had no clue that they were actually inside a video game? And that, you know, that was the genesis of level. When I originally wrote this, you know, back in 2002, um, it was one of those things where you kind of put a budget together and you go, my God, this thing is so expensive. There's no way in hell I could actually produce this. And so you put it on the shelf and you kind of focus on maybe doing some other smaller projects, projects that you can actually control. Because with this one, you need it to be pretty unique. So it kind of sat on the shelf for, you know, for like 10, 12 years until... Uh, I had an opportunity, you know, I teach at a film school and uh, we were supposed to do a, a bigger project where the students would work with me on making a movie. As luck has it, the, the folks that own the film school, they also own this abandoned grocery store. And uh, as soon as I went on to the location and saw it, I went, oh God, we can actually, we can actually make this movie. Originally it was called Reset. Um, and then I found that it was like, I think it was a German short film that uh, was released around the same year called Reset. So I'm like, ah, shit, okay. Now I gotta change the name. So uh, I can't tell you how many different names this movie's had. And then finally we kind of said, oh, let's go with Level. The cool thing about Level is if you spell it backwards, it's Level, which I kind of like because it's this whole 360 degree, you know, you die, you come back, you die, you come back, you know, this repetition. Which is another thing that terrifies me is uh, mundane repetition. I have a reoccurring nightmare that um, pops into my head every once once a year, where I'm trapped in a room with someone who's just repeating the same things over and over and over again to me, and I can't escape. And just that repetition slowly just drives you almost insane. So I thought, you know, this would be an interesting approach to it, this movie, is that if we didn't treat it like a video game, we, we treated it more like hell. Because that's exactly what this character would be dealing with emotionally and uh, mentally, is if you can't die, but yet you're trapped, like, what's, what's more dangerous, you know? Um, being hunted by a monster or being hunted by a monster that will kill you and you'll just come back and the monster will just keep hunting you and there's no way out of it. And I thought, wow, that's, there's some really interesting things to play with inside that world. One of the big things was finding the right actor to play this and um, I had uh, been in an audition session with some of my students and one actor that came in and auditioned for my students was this gentleman here, Noah Gillette. And 
and I really like the subtlety that Noah brings. Um, and he's got such a unique look. And I think that's one of the big things for directors when you're casting a movie is that you want to find an actor who obviously can act, who is, who is really talented in the craft. But you also want an actor that looks unique and different um, because in a way, the actor, their face is branding your movie. You know, you want a face that you can remember. Like when you walk out of the theater and I say, hey, what did you think of the lead actor in that movie? You kind of go, you immediately in your head know what he looks like. And you're like, oh, yeah, no, I really liked him. I thought he was great. And Noah's just got one of those faces, you know, especially his eyes. He's, there's just so much, like, there's, there's an old soul in there. And, um, and there's also a sense of danger and, uh, you know, vulnerability that, uh, that I think he captures really, really well, which is exactly the type of actor that I like working with. One of the other fun things with this film was this is the first time I've ever done like a horror film. One of my main collaborators of this film was the cinematographer Ben Enke. And Ben is where I'm this kind of nut job on a set that barks orders and runs around and acts super crazy. Ben is the complete opposite. He's more like the Zen master. We just complement each other very well. We wanted to explore and play with some different ideas. And one of the big ideas we wanted to play with was darkness. And how dark could we make this movie? Now, if you look at the work that Ben has been doing in the last, you know, five years, I mean, there's such a unique look that he creates when he's, uh, when he's filming anything. It's this perfect little balance of light and composition, which, uh, which really, really gives you a, a way to get into the character's head. Pretty pictures is one thing, but trying to create a frame that gives you a really striking visual image, but at the same time is trying to play off of the um, what's, what the character's going through, I think is, that's the real challenge. Another thing that was a lot of fun in this movie was the sound design. You know, I wanted to make a film that was completely without dialogue. And I had done a movie before called Clean Cut, a little comedy that was like five minutes long. But, um, but I wanted to do something, you know, like a lot longer where there's no dialogue, where it was all sound effects and texture. And this was one of those scenes where I kind of went, you know, this is, this is the sound designer's guitar solo, you know, where we're letting this creature scream in the background and everything is like breaths and we can't see anything and just to really build that tension. Because, you know, I always believe that picture gives you the information. Sound tells you how you're supposed to feel about it. If we had birds chirping in this nice, clear, playful kind of like soundscape, you wouldn't be as terrified as you are right now. There is nothing more fun for a director is when you're in the back of the audience and you know that scare moment's coming and all you're focusing on is all the silhouette heads in front of you that's watching your movie. And when Toothy, which is what we call this monster, um, pops out um, at Noah for the second time and you see everyone jump in the air, it's, yeah, it's, it's from a director standpoint, you kind of go, oh God, that was, that was nice. It's really sadistic and twisted, but that's a lot of fun. One of the other actors uh, that, um, <laughs> that we had in this movie was a cockroach. I was looking for a cockroach, and I got two because you, you buy two because the reason you buy two is in case somebody steps on 
the first one. Um, thankfully, the cockroaches were not harmed in any way, shape, or form. Literally, I had to buy an aquarium and I treat them like pets for the next year and a half because they were so amazing. And this cockroach here, um, I asked my students, I'm like, okay, what's the cockroach's name? And my one student said, well, he's Pablo. I'm like, okay, well, the second cockroach could either be Escobar or Picasso. And clearly I went with Escobar. Nothing was funnier as that, you know, I have a bunch of students working with me on this movie. And so I bring out Pablo and I kind of go, okay, guys, here's the deal. I can't direct this cockroach. I can't tell this cockroach to get to this mark and stop. So we're going to have to do like 30 or 40 takes just to get the take we need. And I'm giving this whole spiel about, like, you know, you can't control it. There's nothing you can do. We just got to keep rolling takes. And the first take, we set Pablo down and he crawled across the floor and literally hit his mark and left the frame. And I went, okay, guys, this never happens. To prove my point, we're going to do another take. And you'll see that this cockroach is clearly has his mind of its own. And we set the cockroach down. And again, he hits his mark perfectly and leaves the frame. And so it was one of these things where we were just kind of blown away by the fact that, you know, this cockroach actually was a pretty good actor. And he's just, just so fascinating to watch. We, we, I think all of us kind of fell in love with Pablo. Escobar, we always left in the cage. Escobar was kind of an asshole. You know, he liked to hiss a lot because these are Madagascar hissing cockroaches. But, uh, you know, Pablo was, was super cool. One of the easiest actors I've ever had to direct. Another person who was incredibly critical to this movie was the editor, Jeremy Wanick. Originally, the script is only 11 pages long. And in film world, each page equals a minute. And so I remember giving Jeremy all the footage and a few weeks has passed and then Jeremy calls me up. And so I'm expecting to get like, you know, an 11 or 12 minute movie because each page equals a minute. And Jeremy calls me up and he's delivering me information where he's like, ah, uh, yeah, I got a first cut of the movie and um, it's coming in at 22 minutes long. And I'm just like, what? Holy shit. What are you doing? Like, are you breaking my movie? And the thing was, is that what we were realizing and what I realized with this film is that tension and suspense is something that needs to be elongated, not shortened. We did do a pass where we tried to shorten the entire movie up, but it didn't feel tense. There was no on the edge of your seat. Everything was just rushed. And so finally, we just had to have that conversation where we said, you know, this movie needs to be as long as this movie needs to be. What's really gratifying about that is when you do show the film to someone. And I have found this new technique that this is how you can tell if somebody likes your movie or not, where you go, uh, hey, how long do you think this movie was? And when we were showing people level, they would respond with, oh, it's what, like 11, 12 minutes? And then when you would say, no, it's 20, the look on everyone's face would be like, it's 20 minutes long? That couldn't be 20 minutes. And you know when someone has completely forgot about the concept of time because they're wrapped up in the movie you're telling, you got something good. Ryan Shadley um, did the creature makeup, uh, this mask. And um, the one thing that I was telling Ryan was that if we're lucky, we're barely going to see this thing in focus. And I, I really don't want to see Toothy a lot. That's, the, again, the nickname we gave the, the monster. But the one thing that I do want to see is if you only see this creature for, you know, 20 or 30 frames, I want to make sure that you see the teeth, that this is something that is just all teeth. You know, it has no eyes. Everything is sound-oriented. Was also another kind of person I point out is uh, the gaffer, um, Owen Seaton, who is a student, who was a student at the time making this. Owen just has such a great sense of light and uh, is really experimental. And so it was really kind of cool to see one of my students like take that position and really run with it. And him and Ben just did a phenomenal job putting this movie together. Like, you know, some of the opening scenes with the, the blue reflecting water against the, the walls and the, the giant fan spinning, you know, it's just, just beautiful images. Uh, speaking of the, the imagery, uh, you know, one, one of the final steps uh, you make when you're making a film is color correction. And we had just an amazing uh, colorist that we worked with on this film, a gentleman by the name of Oscar Boza, who is probably one of the best colorists in the Midwest. And um, I had won this uh, film contest where one of the awards was uh, you could either get $1,000 or you could get a full day of color correction with Oscar Boza. 
And I was like, <laughs> throw the thousand dollars away, man. I want to work with Oscar. And Oscar kind of came in and, uh, you know, really created this really unique look for the world. The thing with this film was I, I didn't want it to be desaturated. You know, I see a lot of horror films and they're really desaturated. And I love color and I love color popping like on screen. And so it's finding that balance of like something that was really dark and moody, but is very colorful at the same time. I'd smack myself if I didn't mention uh, Nathaniel Levinsay, the uh, composer. He knew that we were making a silent film, and um, so he had to basically create this entire soundscape for our movie. And Nathaniel and I are one of the, we're these two guys, if we get on the phone, we can talk for seven hours easy. You know, thank God batteries and phones die, um, because if not, we, I'd still be talking to him right now. And he really created this beautiful soundscape, um, this music and, and texture and everything to really to really put you in the head of, uh, of the film. You know, again, you know, film is visually, it's information, sound-wise, it's how you feel about it. And then Jeremy was also this visual effects, so he was able to create these, like, nice little blood splatters and all that. And, and then we also had uh, Conrad Fleming, who is a visual effects artist, as well as the, uh, another artist um, by the name of Andy Lefton, who did kind of like the last visual effects in, uh, in the film where we had to take the character and bring him from reality to CG. And so all these creatures in the background are all been like green screened and uh, Conrad kind of brought them in. And then uh, Andy kind of created this whole CG version of Noah screaming. Um, you know, and, and then kind of going back to our, our last shot, which is inside this uh, video game store. I was really impressed with what Andy did because, boy, does that CG character look a lot like Noah. And we were kind of going, okay, we want this to be kind of an older video game, not uh, you know, kind of a newer one. So we could break them up a little bit, make them look a little bit more digital and all that jazz. This film was made uh, with the college that I teach at, IPR. And so what's really cool is the fact that, you know, about 90% of the crew were all students and that we worked with them. And this was like three days in July. It was so hot. And uh, it was just really, just really awesome, you know, uh, experience. But it was, it was painful to make, but it was awesome. So cool. Well, thanks a lot for taking uh, 20 minutes of your time to listen to me ramble on. And, uh, you know, stay safe out there. And um, thanks for watching.